in this uh, particular talk, we have, I mean, very less slide and try to do more demo kind of things and try to see if, uh, you know, we can able to make the developer's life a bit easier uh, during this, this process, right? So the, <coughs> the agenda we have, uh, very simple, we have the, the little bit talk about the portman, then with the portman desktop, how you want to connect with these containers and the Kubernetes ecosystem. And then uh, I, I switch it back, I like, then we'll talk about a little bit about the OpenShift local, what it is, how we are actually using it, and then the demo. And then uh, what is our future plans with that project? And, and then the question answers, right? And we are trying to finish it within now 20, 43 minutes, I hope. <coughs> so the Portman. How many of you already know about Portman? Can you raise your hands? And I want to, you know, a bit interactive so that a lot of folks don't feel sleep after this heavy lunch, right? And I also don't want to feel sleep because I'll just talk and talk. So how many people are actually know about Portman? Heard about it? Okay, very less. And how many people are even heard and use the Portman? Ah, more or less. Okay, how many people are actually know about Docker? Just heard about Docker. Oh, nice. And how many people use Docker, actually? Nice. Okay. So when you go back to home, right, today, or in, in this venue, whenever you get a time and you have your laptop, at least try to go to that site and try to see how it is. And uh, I also in, in one of the slides that you don't have to do much. Whatever you are doing with the Docker, uh, without any change, you can just alias Docker with the Portman and all the scripts which you have and all the workflow which you have is start, should start working as expected, like without any failure, right? If there is a failure, then there is an issue on the Portman side. So, what, so, so when we already had Docker, what is the, what is the use of the portman? Why we actually created that, that project, right? So, uh, I think in, in the beginning of the keynote, Ramki already explained some of the philosophy around having the portman. Uh, in the Docker, uh, like, it's a daemon process, which is running behind the root, and we'll see after two, three slides later, like, the, the architecture of the, of the Docker and how the Portman architecture is kind of a different from that. But the another thing is like, we see that within, with one solution doesn't, sorry, yeah, like one tool doesn't fit everything. Like you should not have any one Swiss knife and you can handle all those kind of things. You can have small tools with a specific task which you want to perform and which you want to complete, right? So the way we want to work with the open standard right and open standard means we want to see like even from the community side we get the issues pull request and uh, the portman already have the, the meetings uh, weekly i think with the community uh, which is open to all to join and and discuss about some of the features right and the interoperability compatibility is like something which is you know uh, so you, how many of you know the OCI image layering? OCI opens, right? So there's open uh, container initiatives, open source container initiatives, which actually detail the, the, the specs of the image, the, the spec of the container, how it's supposed to work, how it's supposed to run, how it's supposed to build, and all those things, right? So it should be compatible with that also. <coughs> so why the name is Portman? So uh, the, when, when, we started this project, the, the, the mind share we had is something like, okay, it is not only the containers which we want to manage, but we also want to manage the Kubernetes resources, right? And what is the, the basic unit of the Kubernetes resources? Is the pod, right? This is the basic unit. This is the first unit. And so we started with, okay, we will have the, at least the pod definition as part of the podman, so that 
the user actually able to create the pod using the podman and manage it like it's man, uh, manage the Kubernetes side without actually running any Kubernetes at all, right? So that's why it is like pod manager and the, the name become the podman. As I said, in initially, like right now, if you already use Docker, and if you want to try out Podman, you just need to do the alias. And once you do the alias, whatever the scripting you have, and whatever the workflow you, which you have, is supposed to work as expected without any delay. Uh, as I said, uh, it has the YAML support, like at least the pod level, because it's uh, we only have the pod specific changes right now on the Podman. Uh, we are going to add some more um, Kubernetes resources. So maybe the development, uh, deployment and, and the service part of it. But right now it's the port which is supported. Uh, the, the biggest thing is like no daemon. There is no daemon process which is running. Uh, it works as a fork. And then it has the rootless support from, from the beginning. Like from the inception it has the rootless support. It works with the rootless. And then it's, you can use it as for the developers, so the sister admins, and, and it's run on all the platforms. So right now I'm going to run it on, on the Mac. So that what I was saying before. Uh, this is how the, the Docker actually runs. Uh, so whenever you, so most of the time you use the Docker CLI, right? So whenever you execute any command from the Docker CLI, uh, that's how the the command actually process till your containers run, right? So it every single command goes to the Docker D, which is a daemon, which is running in the root context, and then the container D, and then what the process is executed. But <coughs> in the rootless context, which is actually how the Podman run, it's a fork x method. So every Podman, the command we use. Uh, the cone moon is just very small process, which is actually the main PID which is running, and it exact that particular uh, command, and then uh, with the fork you can have whatever the command ex uh, the result which you want to have. Now there are a lot of people people in the sender sys admin side. So uh, the people who are working with the Linux, they are very familiar about the unit files, the the way they want to run the services. Right, and um, Podman actually make it very easy to create the unit file. There is actually the system degenerator, uh, which is there, and uh, you have the auto updates around it. So this is very basic unit file you have here, uh, which says that okay, I want to have this image, and this is the volume, and when this image execute, I want to have sleep for 100 seconds, and that's it. Now you can just use the system D and enable that service. So every time when your system comes up, this thing is going to execute it, right? And it's as simple as possible. Now, it is, it is very easy on the sysadmin side where they have to manage a lot of services, right? They can't, every single time when a system boots, they can't run every Podman commands. So they can just write the service uh, using the system regenerator and it will automatically have the unit files which you can enable it. There are a lot of uh, resource on the developer's blog about how you can deploy the applications with the multi-cluster with kubelet and the auto updates and rollbacks and everything. So after the session maybe you can just check out those blog posts and see how all things are works there. <coughs> so a bit of summary. Uh, on the Podman side, so the, the main focus is around security. We are Docker compatible. Uh, there is YAML support and the system degree integrations. And it's really bridged the gap between the developer and productions because the developers can use it and in the production, the sysadmin can make the, the unit files out of it and then just run it. Uh, now, uh, in, uh, going forward with the Podman desktop, uh, so this is a kind of you want to replicate what the Docker desktop actually doing, right? Uh, so most of the people are not uh, really like the CLI part, and they want to have some kind of a UI to interact with the uh, with the with the Podman, right? So till now everything was working with the 
uh, CLI and then we wrote this application uh, which supposed to be give you a proper UI front which you can interact with the ports, containers, registries and all those kind of things. So <clears throat> what is what so right now if uh, a developer right so a developers to me is where so the time I take writing the code and then pushing it to the production right how much time I'm consuming how much is inconsistency is there between my environment and when it goes to the production side right so there, there is a always a saying that okay it works on my system and then she said no it's not working on on the production this is how it breaks uh, sometime what user usually do is assume that I'm using the the um, the, the oh, Kubernetes plane, Kubernetes cluster and my target uh, production is using OpenShift. There are a bit of uh, issues in that side also because uh, OpenShift also have the security enabled by default which means you directly can't run any image which is run as a root user but on the plane Kubernetes you can run it. So you might test it on your local system and see oh everything works even with the Kubernetes so it should work with there also but that's not the case. So that's the that's the things like we want to bridge that gap. So <coughs> this is the this is the kind of the adoption barrier which we have. The inner loop is something like how our local developer environment right now looks like, and then on the far left side you see the 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 products and the ops team how they are managing the services, right? So how you how our application is moving from local to production is is the how we can this this wall of discrepancy how we can uh, reduce that part. So so the in in the Portman desktop we have some kind of a plugin mechanism, right? So till this part, this is like the Portman engine which you can use it kind of wrapper right you can manage your containers your port your docker compose if you have and then the far as we have the plugins which is like open shift remote and manage services so we have different plugins we have plugins for kind minikube open shift local where once you are satisfy your application and you want to deploy it either on the plain kubernetes or on the open shift side how you can use it and then we have even uh, plugins for dev sandbox right so you can enable that plugin and deploy the same application to Dev Sandbox how it is going to look like in the production side. Right? So that end-to-end -end, uh, life cycle is taken care of that particular um, uh, one particular tool itself. Uh, now to OpenShift local. So OpenShift 4 is, you know, like how many of you actually deployed OpenShift? Um, OpenShift 4. No one? So, okay, uh, so what I'll say that again when you go back, try to look into it and try to feel the pain which we are feeling day to day sometime, how much time it takes and how much you have to learn to even to deploy those things, right? So, but what OpenShift local do is that it will make bit easier for the developer. It's a single node OpenShift cluster. Uh, the way we do it, like we use the OpenShift single node. Um, so we use OpenShift installer. We create a single node OpenShift cluster, and then we compress that particular image, and that what we distribute it, so that the end user doesn't have to suffer that much of time, and all the kind of as configurations about the DNS and everything like we do. So. It's a quickest way to run or building the OpenShift cluster on the local computer, right? And then you can actually evaluate like whatever the development environment you want to have on your cloud, uh, even locally. So, and then you can deploy your application and see if that works well on, on this particular cluster. Uh, this is the architecture of the OpenShift local. So. The way we work, this, this gray part is like the, this laptop is your local host or local system, right? And this is your host OS, and then we use the native hypervisor 
which means for Windows we use Hyper-V. For Mac we are using uh, Apple virtualizations and then for Linux we are using the LibWort or KVM. Um, and then using the native hypervisor we deploy a VM which already contain all those parts and then we have different kind of a tools, small tools which interact with this, this particular VM. Right? But for the end user, if you go and uh, see in the top, uh, the user only has to do the CRC setup, CRC start, and then uh, OCNV to just to uh, interact with the with the OpenShift cluster. So it, it makes very easy for the developers. So now is the demo part. So the way I have this demo is it's a very basic because I see like a lot of people are not even use Podman and very less people actually used Docker. So I have very basic application, which is a very simple um, HTTP server written in Golang. And it's just, uh, it's just ask for particular, um, it's only have the, I think only the gate method, not even post methods. So we'll see that demo. What we'll try to do is that we will try to, uh, try to, uh, work like, like a developer will work, like uh, create that application, try to run locally, see if that works. Then try to create a container image out of it. Then use that container image and see if that able to run that application again. Then deploy that a particular image to a Kubernetes environment. And finally deploy that particular image to a OpenShift cluster which is like the developer sandbox, right? And everything we are going with, with this Podman desktop so that you are going to familiar with the UI aspect of it also, how it actually works, right? <coughs> yes. Yeah, so there is plugins, which means um, you actually able to connect uh, to the remote cluster which is running using the, the plugin and then you can use the deployment of this particular things without any issue. And we are only doing the port deployments. We are not using any other resources of the Kubernetes like deployments or anything at all. We are only uh, giving till the ports, like the port is the basic unit of it, right? So any, so this plugin is, okay, so there is two things. So the, the plugin which I'm using is the OpenShift sandbox, which is mostly on the OpenShift sandbox side. But then there is another plugin. So in the Kubernetes world, there's something called context. You use the kubectl command and you use a kube config and then you say, okay, I want, and it, the, the kube config have different context. Like this cluster match with this server, this cluster match with this server and all those kind of things. So. This is not a very specific to the Podman desktop, but it show you the context. I will show you that, and it doesn't matter like your, where your Kubernetes cluster is, right? Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, is it visible on the back? So I increase font. Okay. So. As I said, it's a very basic Go application. So I'll show you, it's I think few lines of code. Uh, so there's only three, uh, so yeah, it's only three handlers, it's those three yeah, request handler which we have. And what it do is like, I have a simple basic server which is going to run and when I do this particular URL, it will say hello, uh, goes to hello handler, which will say hello, then this headers and this version, and that's it. And it's, it's going to listen on 8080 port, right? So assume that I'm a developer, I'm, I'm trying to create it, this application, and then the first thing what I'll do is that, okay, I write it out, uh, and on my local system, what I'll do is first is that, okay, let me see if it is run in my local machine, right? So I'll say, okay, go run, hoping everything right. Uh, so yeah, it says like, okay, the bind address is already used. So let's see if I already have some containers which is running. Yeah, one second, I'll delete that. Okay. 
and then let's again try it out. So now my server is running. As I said, it's running on the port 8080. So I can go here and I'll say, okay, local host 8080. And it's a hello, right? Um, right? Uh, and I have two different these things and it's a version is v1 which is fine which is very basic right that means my mm, uh, application is working as expected and I'm able to browse it uh, the next step which I will do is like okay now I have this application I have to containerize it so the, f the next best step is like how to create this container file so the, f the file I have already have so this is the container file I have. It's very basic container file. Uh, I, I'm using multi-stage, but, uh, but even it, it can be very, very simple. You don't have to use the multi-stage also. But what I'm doing is that I'm grabbing this particular image as a builder, and then I build my program, and I keep it the binary name is as my server. And then in the second step, what I'm doing is I, I again using the minimal of UBI image and I copy whatever I built on that particular builder and that's it. I expose this particular port and as a user, I'll tell you why we are using this user uh, when I'll go in the deploying part and the entry point is the my server is the binary, right? It's very simple. Now comes to the Podman desktop, how we run it. So I already have the Podman desktop running. So the interface is something like that. You see this. Here you can see, um, let's go to dashboard, right? So there is some plugin settings. Uh, if you go here, it will say, okay, what all the plugins are running. So I have Podman, which is running, which is version 4.8.0. I have OpenShift Local, which is running uh, this particular version. Then I have a developer sandbox, which is connected and which is running. And then there are other plugins which are installed. I'm not using those, but there are some of them are installed by default, like Docker, Lima. Uh, these are installed default. And even the kind. Uh, then the developer sandbox and OpenShift local is something you need to install if you really want to consume those, right? And installation is very simple. Uh, like you go to the settings, you go to the uh, desktop extension uh, there are a lot of desktop extension the images are there you can use it even you can use the extension which is works with the uh, docker desktop uh, some of the extension you can directly use it right so now uh, the these are the images which i already have some of them but let's assume that i want to create the image so the first thing i say okay i want to build the image it will ask like okay do you have a container file, right? So I say, yes, I have a container file. This is my container file. I select that. Uh, it will say, okay, uh, this is the build context directory, which I'm going to use. What this is for is like, if I'm copying a specific file, this is the directory where it will find that file. If it is not there, it will show the error, right? So this is the build context directory, which I have. Uh, the image name, I'll give it a name of this image. Uh, so that I can even push it later. So I'll say, okay, this is version three. Let's see. Or, yeah, just a tag, right? And then it will start building it. So the command, so right now, whatever I did using UI, you can do it with the CLI, which is like Podman build minus T for the tag and uh, the container file minus F and then the file location and then the final thing is the build context you can give. But for a newbie who never used Podman or Docker, it will be easy to understand, okay, this is the things I have to mention and this is the way I can generate the image out of it, right? So, so once I have that image, uh, it takes some time to build it. So once I have that image, what we'll do is that we'll try to run it in my local system itself, which is using the Podman. So in the container ecosystem, uh, you have an image and then you run the image, which will create a container and then you try to access those containers, right? With the endpoints, like right now we are exposing the port of 8080. So I'm trying to connect with that particular port. Mm. Go build is taking time. It's not a big thing, but the only thing is that it tried to build, get the dependency and then actually build it. So 
it's all depend on the network connectivity and hope it will work but i already have the image so until unless it is built which is fine i'll go back again images i already have a image with v2 which i built just before uh, this session um, yeah this is the the v2 image now what i'll do is that once i have the image right uh, and and you can see there is something called notification uh, and it says that this particular build which we did is still going on and once it's complete it will say it's complete so i'll keep it there if you, i really want to go back it's go to the task and it will go back there right so now i have the image of v2 what i'll do is i'll say okay i just run it and create the the container out of it it will ask some of the things like what will be the name of the container if i'll not give anything it will take a random name but uh, let's not do that let's just say okay i have uh, the name of the container is my server and uh, do you want to put any command uh, like once the container start do you want to run any command on it i don't want anything then it also ask the port mapping like it knows that this port is export do you want to expose that port with the same one on the local host or you want to have a different one which is some same in the command line minus p option which you have right i don't want that i have the same uh, the only thing is that i have to do is uh, yeah i already yeah i on, already <coughs> actually exited from the process so that's all i need and i'll say okay just start that container and now it the container is already started it says starting server and if i see this container is already running and if i'll go here you can see there is a small uh, sec, this this button which will say open to the browser if i'll click here it will ask do i want to open it i say yes and it's the same thing right right now it's running from the container right and uh, the endpoints are still the same uh version is still the v1 right um, so now it works so we created the image we try to deploy it on the the local it works everything good now try to deploy it locally on a cluster right i have the open shift local which is running i want to deploy it on the open shift cluster without pushing that image so be in mind like assume that i have a some um i have a image which have some data which is very uh, secret to the company and i don't want to upload that image to anywhere in any registry right so i so how we can do it so here in the pod one once you build the image which is again the local uh where the v2 this there is a section which will say okay do you want to push that image to the open shift local cluster which means it directly pushes that image to the local cluster you don't have to upload it anywhere so i already have that but i'll again click it and if you go in the task manager it will say it is already pushed our first thing is also completed right so now i don't have to go to the i don't have to push to the query and then then fetch it again but my image is already there in local so now what i'll do is again ba go back here uh, on the container side um and then i'll say okay this is the pod and this is another button which will say okay deploy it on the kubernetes right so i'll say okay i want to deploy it on the kubernetes uh i want to make pod is like okay my server pod it's fine uh on the open shift there is a security context which you, so in the plain kubernetes you don't need but on the open shift there is security context which you have to provide so i'll say okay yes i want to do that because i'm putting it on the open shift cluster and it will create the routes so that i can able to access my application through the route and that's it like if you have if you want to deploy it on a different namespace uh you can select whatever the namespace you want to deploy but i have the default as it is and i'll say okay deploy it and it will say you see how fast it is running because the image is already there it's not able to pull the images like this this is one 108 mb image from the internet so it's already there and it's already says that okay uh, the route is available with this so i can access this it will say do you want yes and i again i have the the application which is running on the open shift cluster now right so everything is right now locally uh, i didn't push the image yet right and even i'll say okay the version which will again the same 
the next thing is that again without pushing the image how we can deploy it on the cluster of the open shift cluster so assume that the, the organization have uh, in house open shift cluster or in house kubernetes cluster so you don't want to push the image on the public registries like quay or docker hub or anywhere uh, so there is another thing which you can do is go if you go here you can see there is registries uh, so you can add the registry which you want uh, since i'm using uh, the developer hub, the registry is already added because there is already registry, co registry configured. But if you are using like a different uh, cluster of the Kubernetes or OpenShift, you can just provide the URL of the registry endpoints and the username and password and you configure it. Once you configure it, uh, you go to the images and then you say that, okay, uh, I, so, so usually what happens is that how you usually put the image to any registry, right? So usually you tag it like the full name of the domain, like quay.io slash whatever the, the namespace you have and the, the image name. But on the OpenShift, uh, uh, the, the developer sandbox side, we already do the tagging. So I already have that thing, which I already pushed to the developer sandbox because here if you see again, if you go to this particular image, there is already a, the icon which will say push that image to the developer sandbox. Once you do that, right, what it do is that it will create a tag automatically. It's just a tag if you, um, if you see the SASM, it will be the same as the image which is this one. It's the same SASM you will see, right? So it just create the tag, nothing else. Uh, you can see even here, the both are the same A9A. Now, what I'll do is, okay, I want to run this image locally. I can do it again. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just remove those things because it's already worked. I don't want to take that particular port, which is 8080. So now I have this image. I'll say, okay, run this image. Same thing. Uh, I'll say, run it as my server. Um, whatever the path, everything. Right, or if I'll go here, yeah. So this is the this is the port. Uh, sorry, this is the port which is running. Now I want to say okay, deploy it to the Kubernetes. Now the the thing which I was saying, the the context, right? Uh, okay, so sorry. What I have to do? I have to select the context first before deploying it on the the cluster. So that's very easy. If you go here, if you see the Kubernetes tag, right? There's a different context available. These are all uh, coming from the kube config file, right? So if you go in the command line using this, so I'll show you like how it looks like on the CLI side. Oh, see. So these are all the context which when you are going to get the gate context and then you can set it using use context command also. But here it is very easy. Uh, I I going to set this, this particular context. And now if you see here down, it's already set my context to the dev sandbox context, right? So now if I'll deploy this image, uh, deploy to the cluster, it will going to automatically get the context. I'll again say, okay, update the manifest port security. I already pushed that image. So everything should be good enough because it's going to use the same registry which where I push the image. So when I see deploy, it's supposed to work. And yes, it's still pending and it says image pull back off. So it looks like the image is not there. So what I'll do is that I'll just push that image back. Uh, where it is here. Push image to the same box. It takes some time because now it's actually using the internet connection from pushing my local to that particular, and it says that it's already, uh, yeah, it's successfully pushed. So now I think my port's supposed to be running. If it is not, it will run soon. Or I can actually delete it and then recreate it with, with that. Uh, 
ah, it says now this, so what happens is, it, so the pod man only understand the pod resource, it doesn't understand the service resource and everything. So once you have that, that resource already there, you can't delete it using the pod man desktop. So that's something you have to do with the, with the command line. So if you see on that particular namespace, all the resources which I have is I have the service and I also have the route which I have to kind of delete those things manually. And then it's supposed to be available. So if you see, this, it is running and I even have the route. So if I actually go to that particular route, it should work. Right, so now it is deployed on the uh, on the dev sandbox, so which is the remote OpenShift cluster. So everything we did, and we didn't push anything to the to the public registry, right? So it's that simple, right now. So this is the this is the demo which I had, like the the proper developer workflow which usually developer might have. So if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, and then let's go back to the slides. So why I choose the department? Yeah, so Docker, okay. So Docker is going to be, Docker desktop is going, I think it's already now a subscription based now. So you have to pay the Docker to use the Docker desktop. So Podman is free? Yeah, it's completely free. Podman desktop is completely free. That's the, that's the thing. That's the, no, I, I think the, in the keynote, I'm not sure if you were there, but we also talked about it's completely free. For any of the platform, it's going to behave same and you can use it. It doesn't matter what is your organization size, uh, are you individual or you are working with the organization. So let's not talking about the Podman desktop or Docker. Okay. Then it means I have experience on this, you know, uh, like Docker. So I can run the my service in a Docker container. Then why I choose the Podman? Sorry, That's what? My, why I choose the Podman as a container? Look, this is not a container, this is a container engine, right? You have different tools to manage your containers, right? You have okay. different flavor. You can use Docker if you are happy with the Docker. You want to see, okay, you are saying that, okay, if I'm not using the port, uh, Docker desktop, which is maybe the subscription, but I'm using something which is like a community available, like Mobi okay. project, right? Because and I'm using the time uh, uh, terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are docker, so it's even with the anything. podman you can use the same thing in the beginning of the talk when I saw you uh, the alias thing okay so the, the biggest difference is the security side like when I saw in the beginning why you should you, why we are actually created the another tool of the podman because of this rootless and all the philosophy we want to have that which doesn't docker doesn't provide by default for you even right now the rootless on the docker is something kind of blurry in the sense of the way it's actually exact the process. But on the Podman side, it's from the beginning, it is like the rootless side of the things. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Can I just finish? <laughs> give, me, give me two minutes. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the Podman uh, desktop is community edition is available. Uh, so you can download it, it's already if you go to Google, say Podman Desktop, there's podmandesktop.io, where you can download it for whatever the platform you want to use it. And then try to explore it, run it, and see. And uh, even the sandbox, if you, if you attended this, uh, the keynote, right, you know that, okay, that's also free. So you can have the sandbox uh, account using your developers.redhat.com and then plug it with the, with the Podman Desktop, right? And the, there are all the things, like we also have the VPN and proxy support configuration support which is the back end like the VPN kit which we are using and all those kind of things which comes from yeah so free open and extendable by default and I think this is the another way like the, the how this Podman desktop actually created it's a UI framework which use these particular toolings and the client use the electron which is closed platform and then this is the virtualization stack uh, which I was saying, the, the Hyper-V, Apple hyper, Hypervisors, and the native, which is the, the QMU, KVM, right? Uh, it also supports the Docker extension, which I told, because it's, you can extend it. So uh, right now, uh, we saw that it kind Lima, Docker, and OpenShift local, and then it has the default registry plugins, so you can configure the default registry. Uh, you can configure the non-secure registry also, so that's there. 
so future capabilities so we are working with so some some of the parts are already done it's a bit old in the sense of we already are working with the apple hypervisor support which is already there in the tech preview in the sense of we can try it out uh, and then the the third point is we want to enhance the the yaml support in the sense of the the resource support right now we are only supporting the port but we want to support the other resources of the kubernetes um, the networking part of it like in the rootless mode there are some of the part which doesn't work as expected so we want to improve it so with the podman 5.x uh, we are changing the networking stack it's going to be uh, something different which will help us with that particular point so and then let us know what you want to see like uh, when you go back uh, and try it out uh, and see if whatever the workload you are currently using on the docker are you able to use it with the podman does the podman make your life a little bit easier uh, or at least the same level which docker actually providing you then it's good and create the issue if you want to have and these are the 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 flow like where if you want to contribute there are some of the points like we want the contribution from that side right now and you can i think this is the screenshot you should take <laughs> in the sense of where you can get those particular toolings right and the slides are i think slides will be available after talk anyway so uh, do i go back yeah. okay i'll give you one minute and i'm done i think that's the next slide is question and answer now you can ask the questions i have 2 minutes left sorry i i didn't hear can you customize it customize of docker desktop yes. so as i told it is a extension base mm -hmm. so assume that there is something which is missing you can add extension to that particular things and then you can customize it according your to your chrome. use chrome sorry on your chrome on your chrome no i i don't think you, it's a, it's a desktop application not a web application in the sense it shouldn't be like it should be like uh, just aliasing it should directly go as smooth as possible so the image created in doc for docker desktop directly you can push to you can just export it and import it on the podman desktop okay because the, the same both the image are oci compatible so it's it should be fine it shouldn't have any issue you can try it out i think yeah so there was some blog post uh, some time back where actually they made some kind of a some kind of a like resource uses comprehensive but it doesn't it's only around the docker side but not the podman side it, it, it's not the comparison but mostly around the docker like how much resource it's using till now uh, we didn't see any kind of issue ag issues regarding the resource limitations and all those things but even there are all so it's very new project right like the, the desktop part is very new and the podman is also like 4 years 5 years back so we are still involving in the and podman was initially only for the linux now we are actually this the podman machine which is actually supporting the the both the different platform and that is very new that is i think a year and a half old or something like that so we are still exploring it and if you see like there is a, some performance issue right you see there is a container file which is able to build in the docker very fast but not in the podman let us know create issue and we'll find a good solution for it any more question yeah uh yes you can run it i think one of my colleague actually uses it just to make sure that the compare it like everything works as expected you can use it i think i don't see any issue till now i mean i'm not using it but somebody use it so i can say okay it works yeah sorry sorry helm charts are supported in this so helm chart is i think on the kubernetes side not on the podman desktop that nothing to do with the podman desktop or docker side right helm chart is i think on the kubernetes side you can install whatever you want whatever the kubernetes resource you want to install you can install it once you have the kubernetes layer right whatever the supported for the kubernetes you can install it yeah sorry when you are compiling a mavel project 
sorry, it's checking what? Uh, yeah, when I'm compiling a Maven project, I can say that it's checking for a suitable Docker environment for, to, for it to run. Yes. If it's not there, it uh, runs in the local and locally. So uh, when I'm switching to Podman desktop instead of Docker desktop, should I ha have any configurations? So yeah, that? I forgot to show you that uh, it should be there. Uh, there is something called this button. It says Docker compatibility. When you click it, what it do is that whatever the Docker socket your Maven project need, right? It enable that, and it's so it will map that particular Docker socket to the Podman in behind the scene, and it should work because a lot of the people in in our org actually using to for that. There, I think there is a blog post also. Maybe check on on the Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you use kind here. No, no, no. Services you can with the kind, whatever you can do with the kind, it's supposed to be done here also without any issue. Okay, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. But again, like there, there is there is a tooling limitation, right? This tool understands the port, but you can deploy the kind, and then you can use the CLI of the cube cube cutl, right? And then you can do whatever you want. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's what I did actually with using OC config actually. Yeah. Yeah. How much the CPU utilization, the memory utilization? Sorry, can you can you repeat? If I want to monitor that container, how much the CPU utilization and memory? I think uh, they have. So I I never tried it out, but if I go to the port, right? Uh, this is which is running. It has some kind of this memory uses and uh, CPU uses. So right now you can see it's using like 10 MB, something like that. I I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's there. And it's using very less CPU, that's why it says 0.0%. But you can manage it, like you can inspect the container. It's, that's mostly the container side of the things. Where you inspect the container, you can see what is the memory usage and CPU uses. Mm -hmm. And if you're using the, C so you can't have all the capability f of the command line to the UI. If you really want to have some kind of advanced things, you always switch back to the UI where you can actually have more options like even telling that, okay, this container is supposed to use only that much of CPU and that much of memory. You can have that on the CLI side, but not here. Like we don't have the option. Like everything is not exposed because otherwise it will be very clattery, right? Because your use case might be then eight, nine percent of the user. So I think here you can fix, I mean, I never tried it out, but I see there is a command line option uh, for the portman. Thank you.